Thank you. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this is the second lecture I've uh, given, and uh, I'm going to continue here on the topic of spin ice, which is a realization of a three-dimensional Coulomb gas in a spin model and also in real materials. Um, let me just remind you, if you weren't there yesterday or if you've forgotten, uh, the key facts about these magnetic monopoles or magnetic charges. First of all, the, the vacuum that they spring from is is a transverse or divergence-free uh, magnetization field. So closed loops of spins that are kind of soup of closed loops of spins uh, with overall disorder, but strong correlations. Um, monopoles are thermally excited sources and sinks uh, of this flux. So they're breaks in the loops, and they live on a kind of network of strings, but they're not paired uh, in any way. Uh, monopole diffusion arises from spin flips. Uh, in the real materials, they, that occurs actually from a sort of local quantum mechanical flipping process, but it, it, there's no coherence beyond that. So it's like a quasi-classical spin flip. Um, and uh, so this is very much like an electrolyte with diffusive dynamics. Um, it's a lattice electrolyte. It's symmetric. There are charges of both types, and they have equal properties. Apart from the charge, of course, is opposite. It's overall neutral. There's no char overall charge imbalance. And it's in the grand canonical ensemble, so the, the charges are thermally excited from the vacuum. The charge number isn't, isn't fixed. But the chemical potential is a material parameter which is fixed. Uh, when, a, when a current of monopoles flows in response to, say, an applied field, it magnetizes the system locally and costs entropy. So it's, it spreads out these, it pulls out these strings and it costs entropy. And that's an important uh, caveat. And this is a thermodynamic equation of motion for the monopoles. So the current is the rate of change of magnetization. It's polarization current because no monopoles pass through the boundaries of the system. Um, and it's proportional to the field minus this term in the magnetization, which ensures equilibrium is reached. So M goes to chi times H at equilibrium. So I wanted to continue asking some of the questions I asked yesterday, in particular, what kind of new insights do we get? And I'll hopefully um, uh, illustrate some of these today. So the plan of uh, today's talk, then, I want to first of all focus on spin ice as a model lattice electrolyte. So this is a sort of background, in a sense, to what comes later. I first want to look at the screening of the, of the Coulomb interaction in the electrolyte, and also the pairing of charges. So in three dimensions, there's no costlitz howlis transition in a, in a three-dimensional Coulomb gas, but there, there is pairing, some pairing of the charges. Uh, which is rather interesting in its own right. Uh, I want to show how, um, then uh, just look at the linear response of the system and show how that agrees with experiments on, on spin ice materials. I then want to go on to the main part of the talk, which is uh, chemical kinetics of magnetic monopoles and far from equilibrium behavior. So I'm going to argue that ordinary chemical kinetics is quite a, is a powerful tool for looking at uh, non-equilibrium and even far from equilibrium behavior. And so if you can map a complex system onto chemical kinetics, which is actually what we do here, then you're, you've, you've got a way of addressing this far from equilibrium behavior. And um, I'll then consider spin ice as a model system for charge generation kinetics. And I'll give other examples uh, of, of that in, in nature. And the particular example I'll be interested in here is what's called the Wien effect of electrochemistry and it famously analyzed by Onsager. So I like to call it Onsager's Wien effect um, and show how this is an effect, a very non-linear and non-equilibrium effect, uh, a pure consequence of the Coulomb interaction and um, uh, an example of how chemical kinetics is strongly modified in the presence of a long-range interaction, giving some universal results. I'll show how that works for spin ice, 
And then I'll finish off with showing how we can use that to uh, understand experiments on nonlinear and far from equilibrium magnetic response in spin ice materials. Then I'll draw some conclusions. So just on the, on the first topic then, the electrolytes. So as long as the magnetization of the system is zero on some reasonable length scale, uh, we can expect spin ice to behave as a model lattice electrolyte. It's a symmetric one. It's overall neutral, and you can think of it in the grand canonical ensemble. And it's a lattice electrolyte, but to a first approximation, we can model it as a continuum electrolyte with a hardcore repulsion to, to remove the Coulomb singularities. And that, of course, is, is, is given by the lattice constant in the lattice electrolyte. Uh, physically speaking, it's like what electrochemists call a weak electrolyte, which is a partly dissociated electrolyte. So an example of that is water. Um, so water dissociates into, into ions. Uh, in water itself, the concentration of these ions is exceptionally small, as I'm sure you all know, uh, but very important. In a general weak electrolyte, the, this concentration might actually be large. So weak is not a statement about the density of charges. It's a statement that the dissociation is incomplete. So uh, let me give you a little bit of background on electrolytes for those who are unfamiliar or, or may have forgotten that this is sort of old stuff. Um, so the first important thing about electrolytes is screening and, of course, the famous debye huckel theory of 1923, very beautiful uh, theory by Debye and Huckel. Uh, and so the basic idea is rather than uh, solve the very complex uh, sort of many body problem, they focus on a single ion, let's say a positive one, and regard it as surrounded by a smeared out ionic cloud. And uh, they have a finite ionic radius so that, uh, so, so that the potential is kind of cut off uh, at the uh, boundary of the ion. Um, and then they consider the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So they write down uh, the Poisson equation with a, with a Boltzmann factor to describe the charge distribution. They linearize it, and then they're able to solve the properties, uh, thermodynamic properties of the electrolyte self-consistently. And uh, this process is strictly valid for small density or, or high temperature, so the parameter uh, the small parameter is, is, in fact, density over, over temperature. Um, and then, just on this picture here, the potential, of course, dies away something like that. It's the famous screened Coulomb potential uh, going as e to the minus kappa r, where kappa is the inverse Debye length. Uh, so that's kappa, sorry, kappa to the minus 1 is a Debye length. And, of course, this is, was the first time in physics that this famous potential was, was introduced. However, there's a, a, an important uh, caveat on, on, on uh, Debye-Huckel theory, um, which is the issue of pairing in electrolytes. So, uh, Bierum in 1926 sort of put his finger on the basic physics of what's going on here, so not long after Debye and Huckel. Um, the point is that um, there's a you can, you can form Coulomb, Coulombically bound pairs in the system. So, and it turns out that not all the charges are free. So there's a, a dissociation of Coulombically bound pairs. Um, now, Bierum analyzed this approximately by considering a, a radius around an ion, which is the so-called Bierum length. And this is, comes, this is a length scale that comes from equating uh, the thermal energy, Kt, with the Coulomb energy. So... Uh, if if uh, an ion gets further away from another one uh, with this length, from this length scale than this length scale, it becomes free. It's, it's liberated by thermal agitation. This is so-called Bierum length. And if a negative ion approaches a positive one and falls within this length scale, it will essentially fall towards the uh, positive ion and stick to it, to a first approximation. Um, in fact, you can do a very simple back-of-the-envelope calculation, which was done by Foss in 1934, just a simple statistical mechanical calculation of the iron pair distribution function. In fact, it's bimodal, 
So the, uh, the first peak is due to Bjerum dipoles, these things, and that's the Bjerum length. And the second peak is due to uh, free charges, as assumed in dubai Huckel theory. Um, in fact, this, the trough in between these peaks doesn't go to zero. Uh, if it did, these would be this would be a strictly a separate chemical species. But Bjerum approximated uh, this trough as going to zero and treated these as a, as a separate chemical species with chemical equilibria uh, to the free charges, which is an approximation, but a very useful one in practical sense. The whole story is much more complicated than that. So, so there are higher order couplings uh, leading eventually to phase separation and strong correlations. And this is what was worked out only relatively recently by Fisher and one of the member of the audience. So how this relates to spin ice is shown here. Um, so in spin ice, because it's analogous to water ice, you, you need to think of a process whereby the vacuum, in a sense, the water molecules, produce a, a pair of charges which then dissociate. So the initial production of charge from the vacuum can be shown like that. So you produce uh, an exciton, in a sense, or a Bjerum pair. These then dissociate. Um, so you overcome, they overcome the Coulomb potential to do this. So this distance here, uh, which is more than twice, sorry, more than half of that energy. So this energy is more than half of that energy because of the Coulomb interaction, is the free monopole chemical potential, which in spin ice materials is essentially a material parameter. Um, and then this, the screening lowers this energy and actually pulls more charges out of the vacuum. Um, so the, the uh, charge density rises a bit further than just as would be given by the pure chemical potential. And uh, so this is the dubai huckel screening. And uh, there's an effective chemical potential, effective energy scale, which is this one here, which is the one that dominates uh, the properties of the system and, and controls the density. And uh, you can work uh, this out with dubai huckel theory and calculate the density and so on. Uh, it's straightforward to apply De dubai huckel theory to, to the spin eye system, uh, and you can calculate the specific heat. Um, and this, uh, this is a, a calculation has no uh, fit fitting parameters uh, because uh, we already know the uh, chemical potential from the mapping of the spin Hamiltonian to the spin ice model, to the monopole model. Um, and so this, this shows theory versus experiment, and you can see it wor works pretty well. The, the points are experimental specific heat for a spin ice material. Uh, I won't go into the fine details of, of this as an experimental issue, but you'll see there's a little bit of a discrepancy up here. This is actually uh, comes from the breakdown of the Debye Huckel approximation of small density over temperature. But rather interestingly in this system, Debye Huckel theory works pretty well at high temperatures uh, because uh, the temperature is high and it works well at low temperatures because the density is low. Uh, so the, this, con this was a continuum theory with the hardcore repulsions, first done by Castellovo et al. But we've recently extended that to include double charge monopoles, which is the only way that uh, you can fit the data at high uh, over the whole temperature range. Uh, you might ask, why don't we use a lattice theory? There's some very nice work by Fisher and colleagues from 2002 doing lattice Debye Huckel theory. Uh, the answer is nobody's yet done it for a non Brave lattice, and we have a diamond lattice here. And so uh, at the moment, we've been content just to use a continuum theory, but you can see that already works pretty well. OK, so um, just to elaborate on this a little bit, electrochemists have something they like to talk about called corresponding states, which is where you introduce a, a rescale temperature and a dimensionless density. Um, and you can uh, collapse a lot of electrolyte properties onto this kind of phase diagram. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, the region of high temperature and low density is the ideal gas region. The, the particles are too far apart to feel their Coulomb forces. 
And then uh, you have the dubai huckel theorem at slightly higher density, slightly uh, higher temperature. Then the a sort of Bjerum pairing region, uh, clustering and so on, and eventually phase separation. Where we are in spin ice, roughly speaking, is in this part of the phase diagram, and indeed up to the sort of high end of that. So each individual spin ice material, because its chemical potential is fixed by, by material parameters, the dipole coupling and exchange constants, um, uh, each material tracks out a trajectory in this space. So the only way we can reach a strong, strongly correlated regime is to find a new material that takes us into that regime. And unfortunately, we're just kind of on the edge of that regime in the spin ice materials that are known. There are about 10 of them known um, at the pr at present. So chemical potential is, is uh, related to, as I mentioned, exchange terms. And it, from a phenomenological point of view, it's the energy of a pair plus the Coulomb energy divided by two. OK, so that was, a, that was a quick look at screening and pairing, and now a linear response. So we can do linear response for the Coulomb gas. Uh, you can write down a set of, first of all, if one can write down a set of drift diffusion equations. Um, this is like one might get for a semiconductor, for example. Um, now, for an electrical system, you'd write down a series of equations like this. Uh, a diffusion, and that's a diffusion term and a drift term. Uh, this little e would be the screening field, the field from the charges. Uh, big E would be an applied field. And then you, have a you can have a polarization current. So if you have an electrolyte in a box, for example, all the current would be a polarization current. Um, you have a continuity equation where I've omitted some chemical kinetic terms here, which prove to be important at later on. They're not important at the level of linear response. And uh, then you have uh, Poisson's equation, or Gauss's law, um, uh, which applies to the screening field. Um, now, the first step in translating this to magnetic monopoles in spin ice is simply to replace uh, electrical quantities with magnetic ones, which I can do in PowerPoint just like that. So I've now replaced electric field with magnetic field, polarization with magnetization, and so on. Uh, but there's one extra term I need to take account of, which is a term I discussed in the last lecture. This um, entropic term here, which is specific to spin ice systems or ice type systems, which is so-called Jacquard field, a reaction field which accounts for the polarization of the vacuum by a current. Apart from that, uh, these equations are the same as the electrical case. So that's just, just a reminder, that's a screening field, and those are carrier generation recombination terms, which I'll come back to later on. And, and all of the, this can be solved analytically uh, for the generalized response functions. For, from a magnetic perspective, we're interested in the wave vector and frequency dependent susceptibility, because this relates to a lot of experimental properties. So it can just um, illustrate a couple of solutions. So for example, at Q equals zero, which is just the bulk AC susceptibility. Um, I won't, again, I, I won't go through this in too much detail, but we can, it, the response is simply Debye-like, um, and we can measure a variety of these uh, various uh, quantities that go into this experimentally, and from that we can isolate the mobility. So we can get, for example, the density from the specific heat, and we can isolate the mobility uh, this is an experimental measurement of the mobility versus temperature. I won't talk about what's happening at high temperature here, but at low temperature, you see the mobility goes as 1 over temperature, which implies a constant diffusion constant uh, and is consistent with the ernst einstein equation, uh, in, in, implying Brownian diffusion of, hop, of monopoles uh, with an athermal hop rate. Um, the hop rate doesn't have to be athermal, and in fact, at low temperature, there's evidence that it, it uh, changes regime and becomes uh, thermally activated. But it, but it works reasonably well. Uh, similarly, we can look at the solution uh, at omega equals zero, zero frequency, which gives you the wave vector dependent susceptibility and hence the dynamical correlation, static correlation functions in reciprocal space that you can measure by neutron scattering, so that, that thing. Um, this is the solution 
uh, you can see there's a so, so this is basically a statement of these pinch points here. And this says that the width of a pinch point uh, is a Lorentzian. Uh, so going across the width there is a Lorentzian. And the width of the Lorentzian is the Debye length. So you can measure the Debye length in that way. Um, that's the experimental data. And you can fit it uh, to the theoretical expectation. It works reasonably well. There are some issues down at low temperature. Uh, actually, the, this, this uh, as you can see, actually, if you carefully compare that with that, it doesn't entirely work well. In fact, it can be improved by uh, a Poisson-Boltzmann approach, which uh, retains some nonlinear terms that are emitted in the uh, linearized um, uh, susceptibility there. Okay, but the point I want to make by all of that is basically that the, the, um, the system, spin-I system, is pretty well defined as a, as a lattice electrolyte. The one major caveat being the addition of this reaction field term, this Jacquard field, which is this extra uh, property that occurs in, in water ice as well. So I now want to go on to the main part of my talk, which is to talk about chemical kinetics and far from equilibrium behavior. So I want to first sort of give an advert for chemical kinetics. So chemists use chemical kinetics, just standard chemical kinetics. I mean, as in physics, we know it, it really goes deeper than that, but just standard sort of chemical kinetics is nevertheless a very powerful tool uh, to describe far from equilibrium systems. Uh, so this was first understood by Lotka in 1909, who wrote down a simple reaction scheme, a so-called autocatalytic reaction, which eventually produces a steady state. And you can very simply, using textbook uh, physical chemistry, write down the uh, kinetic equations for that scheme. And you discover that it approaches steady state. So the density, for example, of this substance A, whatever that might be, uh, approach a steady state in an oscillatory way. So rather than uh, approaching exponentially to the steady state, it oscillates. And this was the start of, uh, as many of you will know, of a, a sort of industry that uh, discovered uh, complicated, uh, far from equilibrium behavior in chemical systems. Uh, possibly the most famous example in experiment is the belusov jabotinsky reaction, where you get these complicated spatial and temporal patterns. So the thing oscillates for a very long time, both in space and time, before it thinks about approaching equilibrium. And this can be pretty much understood using standard chemical kinetics, just a very complicated chemical uh, kinetic scheme with feedback loops and that sort of thing. So, and it's quite remarkable, I think, that something as simple as chemical kinetics can understand all of that. I mean, you need drift diffusion terms, obviously, to, to get the spatial... Um, variations here. So later on, I'm going to show how a kind of emergent chemical kinetics can describe far from equilibrium behavior in a magnet, which is spin ice, which is quite surprising. And I'm going to show this plot in particular. So this is actually the density of monopoles as a function of time after you apply a field. And the blue line is spin ice. You can see that it starts here, and it doesn't it goes up, and then it comes back down again to a much lower value, not actually zero. So there's, a, again, a non-monotonic approach to equilibrium in that case. I'll explain where that comes from a bit later on. So it's also worth thinking in this context as of spin ice as a model system for charge generation kinetics. So I want to make some sort of br broad brushstroke analogies with a, a whole raft of other systems from elsewhere in, in physics and science in general. So let me do that for a few minutes before going back to the chemical kinetics. Um, so this you can think of as a, a universal equation because we've got a, a vacuum producing a pair of charges that has many applications. So as we've already seen, it occurs in water arguably the most important chemical reaction there is as far as the process of life are concerned. It occurs in semiconductors where you produce electron hole pairs. Uh, and at a more exotic level, it occurs 
in QED, in a sense, when you produce electron-positron pairs, the Dirac C. Uh, single law of physics is involved here, which is, is, is the Coulomb interaction. Um, and there's a vacuum. And in general, in all these cases, the physics of the Coulomb law is going to be conditioned by the vacuum in some way. So in a rather trivial way in water, you have the relative permittivity of water. So water is quite polarizable, as you probably know. You, you can rub a pen and attract the stream of water. Um, Similarly, you have the concept of effective mass in semiconductors. And, and uh, at a much more serious level, you have vacuum polarization and, and lamb shift and all that sort of thing in, in QED. Uh, one way of, prob of probing these um, sort of processes is, is to apply a field. So one could apply an electric field to that. And what's going to happen is, you've, let's say you have a pair of charges produced from the vacuum then the field is going to give a tendency to drag them apart. And uh, this field-assisted dissociation occurs in a variety of scenarios. So in electrochemistry, it's called the so-called second Wien effect. And there's a beautiful paper by Onsarg, which I'll return to later, where you actually produce charges from the vacuum by applying electric field. Uh, you can imagine ripping apart a hydrogen atom uh, with an electric field, and a famous calculation by Oppenheimer himself in 1928 did exactly that. You need a really big electric field. Similarly, the so-called Schwinger mechanism of produ production of electron-positron pairs. Uh, at a more practical level, you can imagine field emission, uh, where you eject electrons from a metal surf surf surface, and they interact with their own image charges. Uh, and uh, the so-called Fowler-Nordheim mechanism there. And in solid-state physics, you can actually apply electric fields to solids and ionize them, giving rise to increases in conduction, so by the so-called Poole-Frenkel effect. So all of these involve the Coulombic unbinding, in a sense. And because they all involve the, the same broad physics... Uh, there are some universalities come out, and this is, to some, this is related to the similarity of the processes as well as the algebraic nature of the Coulomb interaction. So what you have then is if you produce a pair from the vacuum and look as a function of distance, then the potential you're dealing with looks something like this. So the, the flat part there, or the sloping part there, is the, f the potential coming from the field, and it adds to the Coulomb potential that binds the charges together. So you get a, a peak. You get a, a, a Coulomb barrier. And there are basically two ways over the barrier. Through the, you can go over the top, classically. And you can do a simple, again, back of the envelope calculation. If you have a, an attempt rate a, with a Boltzmann factor trying to get over this barrier... Um, the barrier becomes lower the stronger the field you apply, and it's a very simple calculation. And uh, you um, can work out a rough approximation to all these effects uh, where the current goes as the exponential of the square root of field divided by temperature. And this characteristic form is a property of the Coulomb interaction. Uh, for example, if you put in a, a different interaction, a different algebraic interaction, you'd get a different exponent there. So this is, in a sense, a, tr a transformation of the Coulomb law. Um, the second way of getting th through the barrier is quantum mechanically tun tunneling it. That's what happens in Fowler-Nordheim tunneling and in the Schwinger mechanism. And in both cases, you get something like the current going as the exponential of uh, an energy scale divided by the field, which uh, comes out of simple um, quantum mechanics. These are approximate expressions, but the, the universality of them is, is largely related to the universality of the, of the algebraic nature of the Coulomb law. So they're characteristics of the Coulomb law. Um, so here I'm going to in what remains of the talk, talk about how all this applies to magnetic monopoles in spin ice. Um, so I'm going to argue that it provides a model system to study such charge generation, 
partly because we have a detailed theory, classical theory, of both the Coulomb law and the vacuum in this case. And also, we have experimental methods to isolate the pair unbinding, which I'll show later on. So I'm now going to talk about this in detail, how it works in spin ice, by talking about Onsaga's Wien effect in spin ice. So Onsaga's Wien effect is an electrochemical phenomenon that we're going to translate into magnetic monopole language for spin ice. So uh, this is really chemical kinetics meeting long-range interactions. And there was a very beautiful paper by Onsaga in 1934, a typical work of genius by Onsaga, um, he solved a very difficult electrodiffusion problem um, for which he even had to invent some new mathematics. He was undeterred in that. And uh, the problem he basically was interested in was if you have molecules dissociating to these Behrend pairs and then dissociating further to free charges, and you apply an electric field, what happens? Uh, now, this, uh, experimentally, it was found there was an increase in charge density and quite a striking increase which then caused an increase in conductivity and a breakdown of Ohm's law, breakdown of the linear conduction law. So there's a field in increase of dissociation rate constant. And Onsaga saw it as, an electro, as, a, as a diffusion problem in the combined electric and Coulomb fields. So this is a three-dimensional potential surface of the, uh, electric, of the Coulomb field of, of pairs. So you regard it as a two-body problem of pairs diffusing in the Coulomb potential and the external field. And remarkably, it's a two-body diffusion problem, a difficult problem to solve. Remarkably, he solved it essentially exactly. And uh, his solution, which I won't go into in detail because it's rather complex, um, but this is the result of it, he discovered that the only thing that happens <laughs> is that the, the dissociation rate constant of these pairs, and actually, before anybody asks, you don't, the approximate nature of, of the Bier and Pe Pierre is, pair is not important for Onsaga's solution. It's just a way of thinking about it. Um, uh, but the dissociation rate goes as a function of the field, um, which is a, a, this Bessel function, and the field is, is a rescaled a dimensionless quantity that goes as the uh, modulus of the applied field. It's a rare example of, of, of a physical property depending on the modulus of a vector property, of a vector field. Um, and from that, he was able to derive the increase in charge density and the conductivity, and therefore could... Uh, uh, um, check against experiments. Now, this function of how the, the um, charge density or conductivity increases with field is shown here. A high temperature is already advertised. It goes as exponential square root of field. That's the that sort of rather universal form coming from the Coulomb law. But at low, temp at low field, it's much more complex and eventually becomes a linear form. Um, and this is what intrigued Onsaga so much because that appears to be contrary to ordinary statistical mechanics uh, expanding around equilibrium states where you'd expect a quadratic increase. Um, now, when Onsaga checked his results against experiment, re remarkably, the line goes through the points with no fitting parameters. Um, the only difference is that there's this small crossover to um, quadratic form. So actually, there is a quadratic form at low field. Onsaga returned to the problem in 90, 30 years later and solved that as well, and that comes from the screening. So, not surprisingly, so the screening eventually restores ordinary expectations of statistical mechanics, but the screening cloud is basically blown away by the applied field, and, and then you, the, the system, you basically have a two-body problem where charges that are created try and escape each other through diffusion, and this is where Onsaga's original solution applies. So the screening, the screened Wien effect uh, correction also fits experimental data extremely well. So just to summarize that rather complicated thing, the, the Onsaga, Onsaga calculated the rate of increase of charge density with field. Uh, sorry, the, and very low field, it's quadratic because of screening. 
even at low fields in dilute systems, it's linear, and then at high fields, it goes over to this universal exponential root field form. So we were interested in, in translating all of this to see if it worked for magnetic monopoles in spin ice. Um, so we had a, a two, so first of all, we did this theoretically, and then we also later did experiments. So um, we had a two-step process to the theory. The first thing to do was to establish that the Wien effect works for a lattice electrolyte. And so I worked here with um, Peter Holdsworth and Roderick Merstner, and the person who did the bulk of the work was Wojciech Kaiser uh, here, who um, managed to, to simulate uh, lattice electrolytes at very low density. The Wien effect had never been simulated before, rather surprisingly, uh, we discovered, which uh, helped us get this into nature material. So first of all, we did this just for lattice electrolyte, and we, we, did, we showed that the Wien effect works pretty much like for a, a continuum electrolyte in that case. But then we went on to study spin ice, where you have the additional effect of these strings between the monopoles and uh, this Jacquard reaction field. So I'll show the results, uh, essentially. So this is what you get. This is from a simulation. This is log of time. This is the density. This is log of time after you apply an electric field. So you have the system sitting at equilibrium, not many charges in the system, small number to, to make screening as small as possible. You apply a field and you, you measure the density in the simulation. Now, the top line there, the brown line, uh, okay, so, sorry, just to, to mention, of course, this is proportional in an electrolyte to the conductivity. So the top line there is the, is the lattice electrolyte. So what you see is the charge density and the conductivity start at a certain value, then they rise, and then they reach a conducting steady state, which has a higher charge density and conductivity than it did at low field. And um, so this is the breakdown of Ohm's law, non-ohmic conduction, and this is the field-dependent increase here. So this is Onsager's Wien effect. Now, the blue line is what happens in spin ice. So you can see that there are two regions here. In this pink region, shaded region, spin ice more or less follows the lattice electrolyte, essentially behaves as a lattice electrolyte. But it suddenly realizes, it remembers that it's a magnet, and uh, the jacquard field kicks in. The entropy cost of conduction becomes too great, and the system gets returned to a new equilibrium, which actually has less charge than it did originally. So rather remarkably in spin ice, the Wien effect manifests itself as an increase to a kind of pseudo steady state that really doesn't last very long. It only lasts for one decade of time there. And then the density falls to a much lower value than it started off with. So it's a non-monotonic approach to equilibrium. Now we discovered remarkably that straightforward chemical kinetics captures all of this. So the green line there is a kinetic model, which is really just textbook chemical kinetics uh, with a little twist. A log of time. Log of time, yeah. yeah so this is density versus time. So, so the, the green line there is, is a kinetic model just uh, based on this, uh, these uh, chemical equilibria with a fast step there and a slow step there. And... Essentially, all one has to do is write down the uh, kinetic equation, Onsager's kinetic equation for the Wien effect for the slow step, and combine that with Rishkin's conductivity equation for spin ice, which, uh, just to remind you, is the um, uh, conductivity of an electrolyte supplemented by this Jacquard field. It's really as simple as that. And this kinetic model works pretty well, as you can see. Um, so, and rather remarkably, you can see that as why, that as, just referring to this chemical kinetic model, if, if the magnetization is small, you can see that the system just behaves like an electrolyte. So the monopole gas becomes an ideal Coulomb gas, 
in the classical empty vacuum at small magnetization or short times. So the, thing, the system thinks it's a, a Coulomb gas, think, thinks it's an electrical Coulomb gas, and then it suddenly remembers it's a magnet and goes back to equilibrium. That's what happens. And, and so we, we have here, in some sense, a model electrolyte study non-linear and non-equilibrium response uh, so just from the theory, a lot of, there's a lot of more interesting experiments one can think of doing. So, for example, if you apply an AC field, um, the, mag the magnetization of the system oscillates in response to the field, but the charge density oscillates with twice the, f the frequency. It doubles the frequency. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the um, charge density increase depends on the modulus of the field. Uh, linearly. And so you get all sorts of funny non-equilibrium and, and sort of non-linear effects in this system. Um, we were also able to say, make a few statements about the effect of microscopic dynamics on this sort of universal mesoscale physics. So for example, for a lattice electrolyte, we were able to show that the mobility changes with field in a certain way. We won't go into that. Um, so this is a sort of broad ref, uh, relevance to a lot of real systems um, that are plotted on this graph. Um, this is a chemical potential and, and uh, temperature. Um, there are two regions on this graph. This is the region where the screened uh, on Saga theory is valid. And this is the green region is what's accessible roughly to, to simulations with the present uh, not ordinary um, techniques. Uh, and so that we have a, a lot of relevance here to all sorts of pro, uh, processes going on in electrolytes, glasses, and uh, solar cells, and that sort of thing. Uh, but so, th so that was uh, the theory of Onsaga's Wien effect in spin ice. It, it doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't go far beyond Onsaga's theory. It's just uh, modified to include the Jacquard field. Um, I, want, I want to finish up for the last few minutes talking about... It, is this observed experimentally in spin ice material? So experiments on nonlinear, far from equilibrium magnetic response. So uh, these are experiments that we published earlier this year. We were basically done by Carly Paulson, Elsa Lotel, and Sean Giblin uh, with crystals from Prabhakar and Matt Sahira. And uh, we published it in uh, earlier this year. So Experimentally, we, we have to deal with a number of rather complex problems. Uh, so at the temperatures we're interested in, which are very low temperatures, less than half a Kelvin, the relaxation becomes very slow as mono because monopoles disappear exponentially. There are not many monopoles in the system. Um, so, but our chemical kinetic approach to the theory means that the, the, the system doesn't have to be at equilibrium. We can use a non-equilibrium starting point. Uh, so we actually have a special technique, which I won't go into, uh, to quench the temperature. And we create uh, an excess of pairs uh, at this low temperature. Now, these, these there are things in spin ice called non-contractible pairs. They're actually pairs that recombine very slowly. Uh, this was shown theoretically by Castelnovo et al. And it's rather simple, because basically there's a type of pair you can draw that if you flip a spin in between them, it creates double charge monopoles rather than annihilating the monopole. So they have to annihilate by going around a loop. And hence, they last longer. So we can take uh, advantage of this by creating a pair population at very low temperatures. So what we do experimentally is after a thermal quench, we, apply, we, we drop the temperature very quickly down to about, a bit, down to about 50 millikelvin. Uh, we apply a field uh, very quickly, magnetic field. We measure the magnetic current versus field. We take the slope, uh, and that gives us one data point. Uh, and then we reheat and repeat. It's a very arduous experiment. We keep on going till we've got millions of data points. So this is the initial current density versus time. So we're basically taking the slopes of these curves. Um, so these, this, these are the guys who did the, did the experiment, and there's some of their equipment. Um, so this, I'll just show you the results. This is a current versus field plot at 65 millikelvin. So this is the monopole current 
uh, versus the initial monopole current versus the applied field. And the red line there is the exponential root field form that is so characteristic of the Coulomb interaction. You can see that if you do a free fit to a power law, you get an exponent of a half rather nicely. So this is the case where we've, we've created an excess of pairs and unbound them with a field. So this is a confirmation of the Coulomb force between magnetic monopoles. And, and personally, this, this was a, uh, at the end of a very long um, process for me because we, uh, uh, we thought up this method a long time ago. And uh, the first couple of times we tried it, uh, it didn't work all that well, but uh, this time it, it's, uh, it really worked. So at somewhat higher temperatures, there's a transition to a, a kinetic regime where uh, the, the principles of Onsager's Wien effect can be tested. Um, so this is the log of the conductivity versus field at different temperatures. You can see the conductivity going up as a function of temperature um, because there are more monopoles coming into the system. Uh, they're thermally activated. And at low field, it's a flat line, so it's ohmic conduction. But then there's this kind of envelope of non-ohmic conduction. And we can fit the Onsager function in this region using the monopole charge as a fitting parameter. We know, in theory, what the monopole charge is. This is just a, a game to see if we can measure it. And also a conductivity uh, parameter. And there are actually two regions of temperature. One is where this all works very well, and we get close to the theoretical charge and the theoretical temperature dependence of the conductivity. And there's a lower temperature region where it breaks down. And we think this is because of the breakdown of these kinetic equilibria, that, that you do need uh, some kind of equilibrium or some kind of uh, uh, sort of return process in the equilibria. Uh, so basically, there's a, a nice regime where we agree pretty well with the Wien effect for magnetic monopoles. So I'll just focus on that regime for a minute. Uh, so we can compare, uh, because we've deliberately uh, arranged to work at low magnetization, we can compare with the Wien effect theory for an electrolyte directly. So that's on Saga's theory, which I've already described. And... Uh, if we plot the conductivity divided by the Onsaga function, it should be a flat line, but we see an exponential approach to the flat line, which comes from screening. Um, <clears throat> this screened Wien effect theory works very well. So the, the red line there is our kinetic screen theory, and it puts a line through all these points, even when the conductivity goes non-monotonically with field. Similarly, put, uh, this is the current density versus field. You can see it, it rises very dramatically with field. And finally, we can even vary the initial concentrations because we're starting out of equilibrium. So we can choose a concentration and uh, the kinetic theory again puts a line through the points. So the basically, the dynamic kinetic model works extremely well in, in, uh, in describing these results. There's one thing that doesn't work all that well, which is the activity coefficient is bigger, than, uh, sorry, smaller than we believe it should be for a Coulomb gas. And we don't really understand that at the moment, but there's some non-ideality coming in that, uh, that, that creates that problem. Okay, so let me now draw some conclusions. Uh, First of all, we've got a magnetic electrolyte with Coulomb interactions and the associated chemical kinetics and some of the uh, non-equilibrium effects that, that go with that. Um, so we've, it's allowed us to study on Sargas Wien effect, which is a non-linear, non-equilibrium uh, effect that can be pictured with chemical kinetics uh, and is a direct consequence of the algebraic nature of the Coulomb field. And, and we get this non-monotonic approach to equilibrium that is borne out experimentally as well. 
Um, I want to make a couple of broader points. So first of all, a point about emergence. I'm sure we all agree that emergence is an overused word, people trying to get grants and things like that. But um, I think we do have a, a case of an emergent property. So in magnetism, we normally start uh, with, uh, we know the crystal structure, for example, we know, we know what spins there are and, and we know the sort of interactions. Uh, so from that, we can write down a spin Hamiltonian. And we obviously hope that we can describe all properties with that. For example, we might want to try describing the far from equilibrium response of a magnetic system with that. But the problem is, when you look at this very ugly Hamiltonian, uh, it's essentially impossible, almost impossible, to go from there to there. And there's no hint as to why you get this funny response. Even to simulate it would be extremely difficult um, going from there to there. So, so what we do instead is we have this mapping to the ice model. We have this transformation to the, of the Hamiltonian then to the magnetic monopole uh, model. Finally, we justify the emergent chemical kinetics and on Sarga's Wien effect. And finally, we're able to put a line through the points and understand the non-far from equilibrium response. And uh, when you look at this Hamiltonian, there's really no clue uh, that this kind of Coulombic response is going to appear in this Hamiltonian, and that, in a sense, is, is, is what we mean by emergence. I, I believe the only way you can do, get from there to there is to go through this mapping to, to a monopole system and then a quasi-chemical system. Uh, so, at a more light, sort of light-hearted sense, you might ask the question, how much progress have we made since the days of Maxwell? Well, Maxwell himself, actually, there's a line in, what, in his book, uh, if we assume the distribution of imaginary substance, which we've called magnetic matter, the potential uh, will be identical with that due to the actual magnetization of every element of the magnet. So he's talking about, he's saying you can use a concept of imaginary matter to model uh, magnetism through the concept of effective magnetic charge. Now, you can pretty much do this for any magnet, of course, so there's nothing new there, but the difference with spin ice is that this magnetic charge has quantized charge and it has quantized energy, uh, and that's, so it, it behaves much more like real matter than Maxwell would have, would have imagined at that point, and so this is the picture that you warned against thinking of in, in textbooks when they cover this, but actually it does occur here. Um, and finally, since, since we're on uh, Maxwell, uh, something about universality. Maxwell starts his, his treatise uh, by, with a long discussion of the magnetic Coulomb law and how pole strength can be measured in the same units as electric charge and what that means and what pitfalls you may go into as a result of getting too excited about that. Um, nowadays, we tend to forget that magnetic properties can be measured in electrical units, but it's interesting here to put our, our measurements back into electrical units. And so we can do that. So we can measure the current in nanoamps and the field in volts per centimeter. And um, just to, to emphasize the universality of the Coulomb interaction in this regard, here I've plotted experimental data for field emission from a tungsten filament where the electron escapes its image charge. You get this straight line against root field. And the lower picture is spin ice at 50 millikelvin, uh, where magnetic monopoles unbind in a similar fashion. And uh, again, the, the straight line against root field is, is a property of, of the, the long-range Coulomb interaction in both cases. So on that strange note, I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs>